Let us draw aside the tartan curtain and present the story of a tradition where any floor, anywhere, can be covered with the right material at the right price. Just about every place I go, the first thing I do is look at the floor. It is a magical product, almost like Turkish delight. It's a tactile. Everything you do is with your hands. Some people say it's a lie. You have to know how to handle it. Linoleum to me is my life. Linoleum, that everyday product that lies comfortably under your feet. It was the most ubiquitous and the most democratic floor covering. Changed the fortunes of a small Scottish town and made it an industrial giant. Thriving. Kirkcaldy was a thriving town. There were factories everywhere. This modern, innovative material graced the floors of millions of homes worldwide. It had a pride of place on royal yachts and palaces and even captured the imagination of famous artists. Kirkcaldy, over just a short space of time, grew to being the world leader for making linoleum. More than 150 years on, the town retains its legacy still making the linoleum that came to define it. This is a story of the people who worked behind the scenes and the unassuming product that changed their lives forever. Going on the train to Kirkcaldy always reminds me of when I was wee. We'd go for a day out to Edinburgh, and although it wasn't really very far, it felt like a great adventure, because Edinburgh was the big city. And then later, when I was a teenager, I used to go to Edinburgh quite a lot, because they had, um, they had bookshops, but they also had all the sort of cool places where you could buy clothes that you couldn't even buy in Fife. Um, and so you know, I'd come back if I'd got enough money on me with a, a t-shirt redolent with the, the fragrance of patchouli from some shop on Coburn Street. So coming home there was always a sort of slight, little bit of regret, you know, you'd had a great time but now it was over. Come north with us, over the Forth, to Fife the Kingdom of Fife. Scotland has a name for skills, from soldiering to shipbuilding, from weaving to engineering. As you come into uh, Fife and along the coast, and you've got some stunning views. You've got beaches and the sea, and, uh, and then as you come into Kirkcaldy, the line takes a turn away from the sea to a vista of factories. Nairns welcome you to Fife, and in particular to their works in Kirkcaldy. I think the Lillian was at the heart of, of the town because the, the, the factories were right at the heart of the town. And you know, my own family, my uncle, worked at Nairn's, and my mum worked for a while in Nairn's offices as well. So it was very much part of the fabric of the town. And as school kids, we all had to learn the poem, The Boy in the Train, you know, which ends up referencing the linoleum industry. For I came myself by the queer-like smell that the next stop's Kirkcaldy. I, I still remember uh, big chunks of that poem, even now. Oh, is that the moon up there in the sky? It's awfully wee and curly. Oh, there's a coo and a cough out by, and a lassie poo a hurley. We're in the tunnel, it's all in the dark. Then he'll be fricked at Daddy. We'll soon be coming to Beveridge Park and the next stop's Kirkcaldy. You've have heard about the, the queer like smell. Whenever you come into Kirkcaldy, on the train you say, you're in Kirkcaldy, you smell the linseed oil, you smell the linoleum. It was a lovely smell, but other people didn't like it. Some people describe the smell as uh, oily, and I describe it as like a walk in a pine forest in summer. And of course the weather affected it. The dampness sort of it used to, I suppose it was hanging like a cloud, wasn't it? It used to cling to your hair and always cling to your clothes so you always had to have working clothes on and you always had to wash your hair about every night. And I was always guaranteed to get a seat on the bus myself on the way home because people would move away to get away from that, that guy who smelled on the back seat. 
actually it became part of your life and I really didn't mind it at all. The linoleum industry had an undeniably huge presence in Kirkcaldy and was at one point the town's largest employer. This meteoric success could be traced back to one name, the firm that started it all. It was the town's oldest and largest linoleum company that went on to become an international brand. The company was Michael Nayan and Co. Alistair Kerr was an engineer at Nairns for 26 years. I was 18 and uh, it was 1965 and I waited at the security gatehouse and someone was sent down from the engineering workshop to collect me. It was um, a bit uh, daunting to come to the, the factory this size, really. The place just looked huge because the buildings were all so tall and you felt quite insignificant, really. In 1847, the first floor cloth factory of Scotland opened in Kirkcaldy, starting a chain of events that would have a huge impact on the town. The original factory was known as Nairn's Folly and was down on the seashore. And uh, the, there's an, an 80 foot difference between the beach and Nether Street where the factory eventually ended up. And then uh, another company had started in this area called the Fife Linoleum Company. As linoleum became increasingly popular around the world, seven factories started production at the small town. Their massive buildings dominated the skyline. In this area down here, where the trees were, was the Kirkcaldy Linoleum Works. There was a linoleum factory just about in every direction. The linoleum companies became gigantic entities, the factories sprawling over 55 acres, about the size of 60 football pitches. Employing 4,000 people, the factories were mini townships with their own power station, fire brigades, restaurants and social clubs. It really does show how much the town depended upon linoleum. The story starts with a ship. In its holds are thousands of gallons of linseed oil, the most important constituent of linoleum. Linoleum is made from a cement based on oxidized linseed oil. This is made by exposing raw linseed oil to hot air by flooding cotton scrim with the oil. Most people think of linoleum as some kind of plain, boring brown flooring. To me, it is a magical product. And it just grabbed my imagination when I came here. Well, I've always felt if somebody hadn't invented linoleum and somebody tried to invent it today, they'd probably get sent to a psychiatrist. Very difficult product to make. Lino has to be treated with a lot of respect. You have to know how to handle it. To a lot of people who come in and visit us, they see it still as magic. We mix and match chemicals and suddenly come up with a thing what you can lay on the floor. I suppose it's very much like baking a cake. You know, you've got big mixes blending everything together and it has to be done correctly. The ideal recipe for linoleum demands all naturally sourced ingredients. Wood flour, cork dust, pine rosin and colour pigments are all mixed together in linseed oil. Linseed oil, you see these lovely purple fields and you take the seeds and you crush it and you get a lovely amber fluid. 
So we take that linseed oil and we react it in reactant vessels, which we call smackers. It's a chemical reaction called oxidation. Most people would associate oxidation with the cars rusting, but for us it's the beginning of linoleum. The charge is finally tipped out into specially prepared trays and allowed to mature for several weeks before it is used. This is the basis of all linoleum. Once we've made the linseed oil cement, which is, is almost like uh, Turkish delight, so it comes out three tons of it in this hot jelly and we put it into trays and tubs and allow it to cool. And it stays like that for four weeks until we can use it. Linseed oil and a blend of rosins have by Nan Alchemy been transformed into cement. Here it is, looking like prime scotch beef. The linoleum cement is pressed intensely to a jute canvas backing by heavy rollers called calendars. So all we're doing at the calendron stage is simulating what happened in nature 60 million years ago. Teutonic plates or whatever and volcanic, you know, erupting and changing the shape. And that's what we do. But our customers don't wait 60 million years for a piece of marble linoleum. So we do it in the space of about two minutes. The giant linoleum sheets are left to dry for several weeks in specially designed rooms standing at an enormous 70 feet. The thing about linoleum is that you don't see your end result for four or five weeks after you've done it, so you have to be meticulous in every part of it. Gently guided down, it meets for all time the high-grade canvas long years of life starting from here. Been made this way for over 150 years and never, never ever in my opinion will die. The idea for linoleum came from the need to improve on a painted fabric called floor cloth that had become popular in Victorian homes. Kirkcaldy Museum and galleries holds some of the country's oldest floor cloths in its archives. I'm looking at uh, an actual sample of floor cloth. It's, it's a very, quite a rare object actually. So, and this was uh, made in 1882. So you can see the painted surface there. It's a bit worn, obviously quite a lot of people have walked over this flooring over the years. Floor cloth itself was made uh, from canvas. There was layers of paint and other raw materials on either side of the canvas and then the pattern was printed on the surface. But there were disadvantages because it was fairly thin, the floor covering, so it could be worn quite easily. There was a, a large range of patterns produced, but floor cloth really was a way of letting the wider range of people have a sort of better flooring in their homes. As floor cloth grew popular in Britain, a canvas trader from Kirkcaldy saw an opportunity that was to change the town's fortunes forever. He was called Michael Nairn. Michael Nairn was a Kirkcaldy man and he was an innovator and entrepreneur. He had great ambition and kind of great aspirations for Kirkcaldy and what the people of Kirkcaldy could produce. And Michael Nairn realised that floor cloth was actually a growing trade. So he borrowed £4,000, a lot of money at that time. And in the late 1840s, he built the very first floor cloth factory in Scotland. It was called the Scottish Floor Cloth Manufactory. It was a huge building and it stood overlooking the sands in the north of Kirkcaldy. It was a massive risk. It was extremely ambitious for such kind of a new business to take off in this way, not to start off that small. People were a bit sceptical and they called the factory Nairn's Folly. Nairn wasn't one to listen to the sceptics. In a letter in December 1847, he asked his friend to invest in his daring new venture, convinced it would pay off. 
Now, the day of the bleaching trade is done. I believe it, and the linen trade of the district too, will still decline, I am persuaded. Will you not then go along with me, and run halves, in this, my great enterprise, and all certain that by our combined application, we could realise at least a moderate competency before the lapse of twenty years? Before he could see the success of his folly, Nairn passed away in 1858, leaving the factory to his wife and son. But his instincts had been right. The business prospered over the next few years as Nairn's floor cloth grew in demand across the country. Michael Nairn took a huge risk and it paid off for him and it paid off for Kirkcaldy. The factory's success inspired other local businesses and several floor cloth companies started up in Kirkcaldy. But a new product was soon to challenge the status quo. For years, inventors had been trying to find a better and more robust floor covering. And in 1861, an English bookmaker, Frederick Walton, was experimenting in his lab when he stumbled on a solution. The story is that Walton observed a paint pot that had been lying open and the linseed oil, which is one of the raw materials used to make linoleum, had oxidised over the top. There's a sort of skim over the top of the paint pot. And that gave him the idea of using linseed oil, mixing it with other raw ingredients to make a linoleum cement. Walton called his creation linoleum. He named it after the key ingredients used in the product. Linum for flax and oleum for oil. He's producing it commercially by 1864, and within a decade, it's becoming a serious rival to floor cloth. Although Walton had patented the process, he made one mistake that was to have big consequences. He didn't protect his trademark, linoleum. In 1876, when the patent expired, it was the opportunity that Nairn's company in Scotland had been waiting for. They had even converted a part of their floor cloth factories in anticipation of this very moment. Within months, Nairn started producing their own brand of Walton's linoleum. Well, I think one of the best indications of uh, the value of a product is when it starts to be imitated. Nairns clearly saw an opportunity that possibly linoleum is going to become a really big rival to floor cloth and perhaps potentially eclipse it in the future. Walton took Nairns' company to court, suing them for using the word linoleum. Unfortunately for the English inventor, the judge ruled against him. It was said that linoleum as a product had become so commonplace that there was no other word to describe it. It's rather like uh, a hoover. Once a name becomes known by everyone, it then is very difficult to stop it being used by other people. The court ruling was no small victory. Within a decade of its invention, linoleum had become a household name in Britain, gracing the floors of homes, offices, and public buildings. It really was a democratic floor covering. It was available to people who couldn't afford carpet, who couldn't afford fine parquet floors or marble floors. And how wonderful to suddenly have a floor covering that very realistically imitated the effect of these materials. As the 19th century came to a close, Kirkcaldy companies like Nairn and Barry Osler and Shepherd had become the world's leading producers of linoleum. Kirkcaldy, over just a short space of time, grew from being a sort of medium-sized town that maybe not many people had heard of, to being the world leader for making linoleum. The products were exported throughout Britain, but then quickly went across the world. So, Really an amazing story over just a short space of time. The story of Michael Nairn is part of a larger story 
that of Scotland and her tradition of exporting craftsmanship and quality to the world. Some of this fair heritage endures in the floor coverings which carry the name of Nairn everywhere. An old name carried proudly for over a hundred years of honest endeavour in a highly competitive field. Getting a job with Michael Nairn and Company was regarded as one of the top things you could do. In those days, and this will be meaningless to most people nowadays, a job for life. Continuity of skill is regarded highly here in Kakori, the various apprentice schemes being well supported. We must have been an advert, I must have applied, and my mother came with me. I do remember going for an interview because there's a long walk down the drive and I felt all eyes were on me. The interview was rather uh, strange for me in as much as what was discussed was my dress wear, which had to be a suit and colour and tie, uh, worked uh, every second Saturday and at that particular time you were allowed to wear a sports jacket on the Saturday. I remember growing up playing outside my home and this red sports car drew up, driven by a, a Greek god. And I remember dashing up to my father and asking him who was this god. And it turned out that uh, he was in sales. I decided there and then this was for me. Linoleum is die cut into tiles and conveyed past a team of inspecting girls who look for any irregularities. I was saying to my dad, and he says, I'll get you a job. I says, oh, wait a minute, dad, just what kind of job? I'll get you in there, and says, beside me. I used to examine tiles. My dad thought I would enjoy, and it was near him, so he could keep an eye on me. I was 15 years old when I started working in Barry's. It was almost a family thing. My grandfather worked in Barry's, my father worked in Barry's most of which was in the waiting departments and because they were covered in white from head to foot they were nicknamed the ghosts, Barry's ghosts. Under the same roof is organised the dispatch of high quality linoleum to overseas distributors, customers and subsidiaries. I got involved uh, with the company because I suppose I was destined to go there. Michael Nairn was my great great grandfather uh, and he was the one who started the floor cloth business in Kikori. My first proper jobs was in the export department. I had a fairly plummy voice, but I've never found that to be any real disadvantage talking to people. On my first day at work, you had to report to the head office commissioner, who was a sergeant major in the army, was in the Corps of Commissioners, and he looked after the boys. So a disciplinarian of the old style did me no harm whatsoever. Now converted into luxury flats, Nairn's head office had become the centre of operations for the family business. Janet Potts has been with Nairn's for 47 years but this is our first visit since the offices moved in 1986. This is uh, the old office where I first started to work and it's just a wonderful building and it's great to come back. I have been with the company 47 years now, so <laughs> quite a long time. <laughs> I was uh, 15 at the time, just two weeks short of my 16th birthday. So many people from the town itself worked here because Nairn would be one of the biggest, if not the biggest employer at the time. Um, my grandparents and aunts and uncles also worked here, so it was great to follow in that tradition. I came here on the 12th of January 1970. When I first walked in up these steps, back then it was just, oh wow, what an impressive building. 
beautiful lift shafts, all that lovely raw iron. It's really quite taken with it all. Upstairs there was the sales department, which is a busy hub in there, and the export department at one end. And then had a typist pool. You know, there's the typists typing up all the um, correspondence. My first job in here was in the mail room, which was located just behind this uh, framed window here. Our job was to open the mail each morning and then we would put it in a big leather bin bucket, take it round to the boardroom of all places, empty it all on the table, then we would sift through it all and, you know, we would uh, put it into different bundles for the various departments and then we'd go on our little rounds doing our wee post, post rounds. <laughs> we were rushed off our feet all day, believe it or not. <laughs> You had a break for, what, 15 minutes or so, morning and afternoons. The lady would come along the little trolley, and on the trolley she would have a little tea urn. So we always looked for Mary coming with the trolley, <laughs> which was great. I think what's made me stay is, it was probably not just only the products, but the actual people themselves, you know, and the fact that it was a nice family, friendly atmosphere to work amongst. So I never ever gave it a thought to move and obviously I'll end my career here. <laughs> yeah, lovely happy memories here. At the dawn of the 20th century, as Britain embraced modernization, linoleum had become a top selling product and Kirkcaldy's factories were leading the way. Linoleum was king. It had seen off all its rivals. There were churning out thousands and thousands of tons of linoleum every year. Householders had a huge amount of choice available to them and for many people it was incredibly confusing. Nairn's company found a way to showcase their product. They turned their company diaries into beautiful catalogues that featured their finest linoleum patterns. We've got some what the company knows of, so the little red books which are called uh, Diaries and Buyer's Guide. The purpose of the Red Book, as far as Nairns are concerned, is to show their linoleum patterns. So this would have gone out to two customers, and the idea of using um, what we would call marketing was very novel in those days. They present a very interesting picture of the changes that were happening in the world at that time. And you have an artist's impression of the factory, which takes up the two pages. And the interesting fact here is that it's got smoke pouring out of the chimneys. That is the company saying, we are, are powerful manufacturers, we make things. It was doing something which was new, and we're used to fast-moving changes today. And this really was a big change coming in there. For the linoleum manufacturers, design was everything. They would try to outdo each other by producing a massive range of patterns. I think Nairns produced over three or four hundred designs a year, every single year. Even though patterned linoleum was made on an industrial scale, it was still mostly crafted by hand. From the squared paper of the designer, the pattern is transferred to wooden blocks. Brass segments are inserted and leveled off. The patterns in the early years were made by using wooden printing blocks. So for each pattern, there'd be quite a lot of printing blocks required. The blocks are mounted, the color hoppers charged with their brilliant contents, and in an oscillating rhythmic progression, 
a profusion of color is printed onto the base. Designs were also created using inlaid linoleum. Girls with meticulous skill build patterns by hand. They use die-cut shapes made from a special mix of linoleum and assemble them onto pattern guides on the conveyor. Traditionally made by women, inlaid linoleum was a laborious process that required attention to detail. The linoleum pieces were carefully assembled to create a repetitive design and then pressed together to form a uniform sheet. One small company in London still continues to make inlaid linoleum by hand. We're going to start up in this corner. We're going to transfer this design over to a piece of lino and we're going to freehand the shape onto the lino, just using pencil, and that gives us a guide for when we draw the knife through. I've been floor laying uh, for near enough 40 years now, but my main material, which I, I love working with, is the linoleum. Earliest memories of linoleum is probably like everybody else, is going around your grandparents, having the linoleum on the floor, um, some very weird colours, obviously cutting your feet on the edges where the edges used to be curled up. Inlaid linoleum is created by the imagination, basically, and then we have the design like so. We're ready to inlay. Probably the most stressful part of inlaying is, is that, that cut, that's the be-all and end-all cut. And there's no room for error whatsoever, because once that piece of lino is in the floor and you cut round it, once you make a mistake, basically your floor is ruined. You only get one chance, you've got to be really confident in your marks and hope, well, not hopefully, it will. An experienced fiddle will probably make it fit 99.9% .9 of the time. I like everything about it. Some people say it's alive because it does move around with, you know, the conditions of the room, the temperatures. So there are, there are challenges and, and it's, a, it's a material that you do have to take your time with. The end floor is going to actually look like this, so you can see it in its full beauty. Loads of colour, loads of shape. You can take it a step further and have some really nice geometric shapes, or we can go really to the extreme and, and do something as intricate as, as this Moroccan design. And, and obviously, you know, some people look at this and they just think, oh, it's, it's been rolled off a machine. But no, every, every inch of this board has been done by hand. The effect at the end of the day is, is, is pretty, pretty amazing. Do I see myself as an artist? I do. Might sound a little bit pretentious, but I, I, I do. With the designs, it's a sort of part of me, it's somewhere where I can sort of create something. We can just make a, a simple floor look something very, very unique and individual. In 1939, the Second World War broke out. I remember the air raid sirens living opposite a factory that instead of making linoleum, made ammunition. As Britain was drawn into the conflict, Kirkcaldy's linoleum factories quickly adapted to join the war effort. Nairns, for example, made fuel tanks for aircraft and also munitions and armaments were produced. Engineers within the Kirkcaldy linoleum industries were very innovative as they had to repurpose a lot of the machinery that was used to create linoleum products. And this in turn meant that they could manufacture shells, shell casings and bomb casings. The factory's massive scale was specially suited to make casings for the RAF Bomber Command's Grand Slam and tall boy weapons. They were the largest non-atomic bombs used in the war. 
In 1945, with war at an end, Kirkcaldy, like so many other industrial areas of Britain, concentrated on getting back on its feet. After the end of the war, there's a huge desire on the part of both manufacturers and consumers to get back to normal. Manufacturers are back in production within a year or two years. Consumers, many of whom are for the very first time thinking about buying their own homes in these suburban housing estates that are springing up all over Britain, they're looking for cheap, modern materials and products with which they can furnish their home. Bridget washes over her known floor with a mild liquid detergent before polishing. Ideal treatment for known linoleum. And linoleum is one of the most appropriate and most available as far as that goes. Nairns are extremely busy. Loads of lorries going in and out the gates continually filled up the rolls of lino, going to various parts of the country and, and also abroad. Before you could get away on a Friday night, which was the day that the London steamer left Kirkcaldy Harbour for King George V dock on the Thames, you had to make sure that what you had sent to the factory had been dispatched and that had to square to the last item. High tide was at such and such a time, so girls, you've got to be ready, and they used to get to load it up. The captain raging on the bridge, concerned he's going to miss the tide. Yes, it was very busy. You were on the go the whole time. Nairns are proud of installations all over Britain. But now let's fly to the continent, to France, to look for that familiar name on French floors. The linoleum companies, you could call them multinationals. Um, they have markets well beyond Britain. And as a sign of the, the, the strength of those markets, they then decide to build their own production facilities. So factories are built in France, in Germany, in America. And that's because of the demand. Now, crossing oceans in a wink, we'll soon steam up the broad St. Lawrence to Montreal, Canada. That was probably the halcyon years for men, and the town's fortunes were determined by the company's fortunes. Scottish linoleum companies were king in the 1950s, and it didn't take long for their prosperity to trickle down to their hometown of Kirkcaldy. Kirkcaldy, when I was growing up, was a prosperous town. Um, the linoleum factories employed a lot of people, the pit employed a lot of men, and there was a real sense of, of, of the town having a bit about it, a bit of, a bit of zhuzh. Thriving. Kirkcaldy was a thriving town. It was a great shopping centre. I can remember very, very clearly, lots of people used to come from central Scotland on a Saturday to Kirkcaldy High Street. There were quite a few cinemas, two or three dance halls. There weren't discos in those days, it was dance halls. On a Saturday, you couldn't get going. Plus, we had an awful lot of hotels in Kirkcaldy. I worked in the, the Station Hotel as a waitress uh, when I was in my teens. Uh, and it, it was always busy on the weekend, people coming in for their high tea. You know, you'd go down the high street on a Saturday, it was full of people, you'd be pushing your way through the crowds. It was clearly uh, a time where people had some money to spend. It didn't feel depressed like other parts of Fife. I remember my, my, my pal Ian Rankin talking about growing up in Carden Den a few miles away. And, you know, for him coming to Kirkcaldy was like a trip to the big city. Um, it was to him what going to Edinburgh was to me, I think, that, that excitement. Big city, bright lights. Companies like Den and Barry's funded libraries, hospitals and parks in the town, creating communities for people both in their factories and outside. They had their own housing and I lived in a house which was just right opposite the factory. Must have been about 48 flats in the area I was in, and every one there was either a Barry's worker or someone who had been a Barry's worker. Yes, I, because we stayed in Ernst's house. When I was first married, 
That was my first house overlooking the harbour. And then you've seen their great big ships there. They used to wave to me and I got around from my mum and says, my goodness, you don't wave to strangers, especially sailors. I says, but they're waving to me. She says, that doesn't matter. But just kept waving. The social aspect of working with a company, there was a whole lot of offshoots in the sense of various organisations and um, sporting activities that, that took place. Everything from the gramophone society through to Nairn Star football team to the tennis courts and the bowling green and such like. Nairn's and Boris had some rivalries but they were all friendly rivalries so we met quite often on the, the football pitch or cricket pitch. There was lots of sports things, but I'm not a particularly a sporty person. But the staff dance was quite a big thing, because it was once a year, and it was black tie, and you had to buy your evening dress. And probably that was the first evening dress I ever had. Well, every year, the head office would have a party, quite a big do. And although I wasn't in the head office, I used to go, because <laughs> I knew people. Everyone trying to make an impression, and everybody rushing to the local hire shop to get their uh, dinner jacket and their black tie. And there was a huge walk-in safe, and that's a bit of frivolity <laughs> up there afterwards. The company had the Burns Supper, which was a hilarious uh, event, as you can imagine with many people saying things and doing things that they wouldn't want repeated. 150 men in the office and 450 women, one was spoiled for choice and one didn't have to be Paul Newman to be successful in uh, meeting up with young ladies. And I met up with the best young lady, of course, uh, my wife now and have been for the past 52 years. And a lot of romances started there. And that's when I started going out with my husband. I met my wife there. Uh, she was responsible for making the cardboard tubes that go into the centre of the linoleum rolls. And I met her one day when I was asked to go in to fit a heater in her department because the, her and her colleague were complaining about the cold. So I was lucky there. I used to examine tiles. And then, if there was any, not anything quite right, we had to send for a tinsmith. And this young guy came through, a lovely blonde guy, and he started chatting. But he always had a bag of sweets in his pocket. But I was young enough, I didn't realise it. He always he seemed to land up at my side. And, do you want a sweetie, Betty? And I said, oh, well, I'll never refuse a sweetie. New developments in flooring technology have brought vinyl into the picture. Vinyl is a modern plastic material with properties which are particularly suitable for use in floor covering. Linoleum's position at the top had been undisputed for more than half a century, but a new invention, vinyl floor tiles, was growing hugely popular with homeowners. People began to fall out of love with linoleum in the 1950s and 1960s, and I'm afraid it happened really quickly. I think in some ways the name linoleum began to be pejorative. People saw it as being a bit old-fashioned, if you like. There was new floor coverings like vinyl. Here's a floor done in new Ken Tile Easy Clean Solid Vinyl Tile. It lights up a room with beauty, is wonderfully easy to care for, and virtually never wears out its welcome. By the 1960s, the vinyl floor had become a best-selling product. While it imitated linoleum in its appearance, it was significantly cheaper, faster to make and easier to install. There was another reason why vinyl tiles became fashionable. In the 1950s, women's fashions changed and women started wearing high heels. And linoleum was a soft, pliable product, and it was damaged by high heels. There's the important question of indentation resistance. A couple of years after I started, I, 
stiletto heels came into fashion and I wore quite high heels. Some new type of lino was being tested because stilettos were ruining floors. So I used to go down and I would stand on these pieces of linoleum and see how far it went in. Nairns were forced into making a lino that could withstand the pressure of a stiletto heel. So they invented armour floor. Millions of square metres of armour floor have been laid in this country and overseas. It was specifically designed to resist high point loading from stiletto heels and furniture. And one of the things that was done by our marketing people at the time was they hired a tank, I can't remember from where, it was probably one of the local regiments, and um, had it in the townhouse square, again, to demonstrate that a tank could roll over armour floor and uh, successfully get to the other side without demolishing the thing completely. So a squad of us went down at six o'clock in the morning, the photographers appeared and took various pictures of the, the tanks and on the lino. So that was a bit of a publicity thing to show about the strength of the product and that it would withstand all the ladies prancing about in stiletto heels. Not a lot of people know this. It went right through the lino, through the board, through the slabs underneath, and we did a quick patch-up job at the tail end and everything was fine. Despite the industry's best efforts, carpet and vinyl soon took over from linoleum as a flooring choice. Dwindling sales crippled smaller linoleum factories all over the country, forcing them to close. It was a lifestyle and a working environment that people imagined would never change. It would be here forever. But it did change. And Barry stops production in 1963. And that leaves Nairns as the sole linoleum company in Kirkcaldy. <laughs> When Barry's closed down, it hit a lot of people. There was, was over 2,000 jobs went with Barry's. And it was a pretty drastic time. In September 1962, Nairn merged with a Lancaster-based linoleum manufacturer called Williamson. There's a lot of bad times then because the Lancaster people were saying that these Scotsmen were coming down with their axes and taking all our work away. But then part of the deal was that some of the managers and workers from Lancaster would be offered a job in Scotland. And then if you like, they became the axe welders because people in Scotland would go to their work one morning and be told not to go to their office, just to go home and someone from Lancaster had taken over their job. The whole idea was, you know, economy at the end of the day. You couldn't continue in life with two of everything and two of everyone. Uh, that's just life, isn't it? Life moves on. Through the next decade, Kakodi faced more troubling times. The closure of the linoleum factories and the loss of many local coal mines brought unemployment to the area. The once bustling harbour stood still. I think Kirkcaldy is a much less prosperous place than it was when I was growing up. When I was wee, uh, there was a sense of prosperity. The town was busy, the high street was busy. But, but that, sadly, is something that has, has departed now. And I think that's hard for people when they grew up in a town that, that felt prosperous, where they felt that there would always be jobs and there would always be a certain standard of living. And I think for a lot of people, that hasn't proved to be the case.
While it had fallen out of favor at home, linoleum found a lifeline in Europe, where it had been reinvented as an artistic medium. A printmaking technique called linocut was being popularized by artists like Picasso and Matisse. This is a block of linoleum, and what I'm doing is I'm transferring my design onto what we call the block for the line of cut. And by just redrawing the drawing, there's an awful lot of redrawing of the drawing. Linda Farkerson has been making line of cut prints for over 30 years. My first introduction to linoleum was at art school. Up until then, I'd only known it really as a flooring material. I walked into the printmaking department and uh, the tutor, um, a man called Robert Fraser, he, he threw all these prints across uh, his table and there's uh, just this amazing kaleidoscope of colour and pattern and it just made you want to do it, you wanted to have a go. I think people really liked um, working with linoleum because it is an easier medium than wood. It's um, more flexible. I like the surface, I like the way you cut it, I like the feel of it, I like the smell of it. It's very tactile. Your, your hands are holding the tools, they're cutting the, the block. You're constantly in touch with the material. I'm going to um, ink the block up and, um, and just take an impression. But yes, it's always a moment of truth. <laughs> and then put this in the press. Pull the handle, the platen comes down to be it printed. It, it's always that lovely moment of revelation when you pull back the paper and, and you see what's there. And sometimes you do get little surprises and it's changed. It's changed from being a, a drawing and something you've been cutting and suddenly it's, you know, this piece of colour. Uh, it's really interesting to think that you've taken something very ordinary like a piece of lino and suddenly you know you've transformed it into a completely different medium it's just amazing I remember one night uh, in the mid-1990s, I suppose it must have been, I was up visiting my mum uh, and I went up to the fish and chip shop to get her tea. I was driving along Factory Road and I suddenly went, I know that smell. And I got back home and I said to my mum, are they making linoleum again? She said, aye, they've started making it again. Apparently it's very green. People like it. So that was uh, the return of linoleum and, and it was the smell that brought it right back to, to me from my childhood. In the late 1980s, international flooring company Forbo bought over Nairn Williamson. To the surprise of many, Forbo revived the production of Kakadi's famous flooring material, linoleum. They tapped into linoleum's credentials as an eco-friendly and natural product, which was making it attractive to a new generation of customers. Forbo had realised that linoleum was coming back and it was only a cycle of decline. And it had cycled into decline many times before and always come back. So in the 90s, the investment in this factory in particular was enormous, I mean, just phenomenal, as linoleum continued in its rise again. Today, the Forbo Nairn factory employs over 200 people 
and is the only place in Britain to manufacture linoleum. This is a linoleum flooring. This is what goes on your floors. The actual product itself has not changed that much, but the actual machinery is more modern, it's up to date. Currently I'm uh, looking for any faults. I mean, we get the experience from the older people on the staff, so we're not so bad that way. Once you've made it, you can go in a shop and you can you actually find yourself walking around the shop looking at it going, I made that, I made that. So yeah, you take pride in it. Linoleum also found itself in the centre of a worldwide trend in the 80s that saw it taken out of homes and onto the streets. Through. Nancy McAndrew was one of the first female breakdancers in Scotland and has been performing for 35 years. It was uh, a kind of strange culture for people in Kirkcaldy when they seen us. We used to get some weird looks when we used to go down the promenade and we'd have a small bit of linoleum and it was the perfect surface for the breakdance on. It's the sound that's made in the linoleum, and it's almost like making music. If it was any other surface, you don't get the same sound. When you first step on that, that fresh bit of linoleum, knowing that you're the first person that's ever been on it, it's a fantastic feeling. It's like all your troubles go away. You just have not a care in the world. Over a hundred years of experience lies behind the product. And the recent revival of interest in linoleum has arisen largely because it has shown how well it has stood the test of time. find it very nostalgic to smell it when I'm in the town again. It takes me back because I did enjoy my stay here. I think looking back it gave me a chance, gave me a job, gave me something to, that I could build the rest of my life on. It had been my life for so many years, met so many different people and made so many different friends. And it was a great adventure, a bit of fun. I thought it was great. I loved it. It's a happy place to work, I have to admit. I think most people would feel the same. I, I actually, I loved working. I loved every minute of it. That's what keeps you young. To me, it's been magic. As, and I don't want to retire. I want to stay making a lot of Hitting the high seas next here on BBC Scotland, it's a busy market day in Fishtown.